Hey, hey, all back again. Today we're going to finish up Immanuel Kant's The Critique of Judgment, looking at the second half or the second book or part titled The Critique of Teleological Judgment, which follows the critique of aesthetic judgment. And with this, we'll finish up Kant's critical system comprised of the critique of pure reason, the critique of practical reason, and finally the critique of judgment or the critique of power of judgment. Um, now, before jumping into that, if you want to follow me on Instagram to see pictures of my cats, uh, you can find me at, at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. Um, you can find this in podcast form if you found it on YouTube, which would, you know, there are no ads there. And I, I hope to keep it that way because they're really annoying. And I know the ads in on YouTube are annoying, uh, but they're a way I managed to accrue a little bit of income. Um, and if you're listening to this in podcast form, you can find the YouTube version in the, you know, pretty easily. And there I upload some videos sometimes that you might, you might like, including doing live things and whatnot, which I intend to do more of. And if you want to contribute monetarily, you can do that through PayPal or Patreon. That'd be greatly appreciated. And I have to extend a thanks to everyone that's helped me out so far. I can't say, I can't say how, how grateful I am. Uh, and if not, you know, any like, share, subscribe, you know, all that helps a lot too. So without further ado, don't want to waste any of your, more of your time. Let's jump into the critique of teleological judgment. So seeing as this immediately follows the critique of aesthetic judgment, I don't want to go into a whole big thing kind of summarizing that. Go check out that video if you'd like. Um, but just to give, you know, a very brief thing, he talks about the, the beautiful the recognition of beautiful objects being uh, the recognition of a concordance or a kind of agreement between perceiving subjects and the thing in the world. And that thing isn't seen in terms of its content, it seems purely in its form. So what Kant is drawing attention to is the very propensity that humans have to recognize something as beautiful, rather than saying that there are beautiful objects and as opposed to unbeautiful objects. Now he adds to that the idea of the sublime and the sublime is an object or a moment when we come in contact with something that we can't necessarily fathom it extends beyond our imaginative and cognitive capacities it goes beyond everything we know and some example might be like the pyramids or you know the mountains and the you know the himalayas or the rockies or anything like that that you know ex expand beyond what our minds seem capable of cognizing or understanding and in that moment, Kant says that we are propelled into something new. We are challenged, and by being challenged, we are opened up to something new, into the sublime. And he, he, you know, he goes so far as to say that this thing that we are experiencing, a sublime thing, is never more than our own mind is capable of uh, understanding. And that is because we don't see anything that that is outside of what our mind is capable of grasping it's always something within our mind and so because of that although it forces us into something new it stretches the boundaries of our imagination it is still bound by our imagination to some extent and with that we develop not only a respect for the object itself but a respect for our own mind's capacity to experience that object essentially mirroring that object because this is the the crux of Kant's theory in these three books is that the human mind or the mind and the world are tethered together. They, they form a knot that can't be unraveled. So that propels us here into the critique of teleological judgment. So he starts out by saying, pretty much, if nature contains beautiful objects as he's set them out in the first half in the critique of aesthetic judgment, we can at least assume transcendentally, that is considering uh, the relationship between human cognition and things in the, in the world as constituting both, we can assume then that some design had humans in mind. There was some like design that allowed humans to be able to experience things in the world and moreover to be able to recognize things as beautiful or not. So we can't 
intuit this uh or into it that's a scary word in kantian terms but we can't cognize this or rationalize this a priori we need to look at nature and that is one of the big things that he does in this book is he turns to nature turns to organisms turns to the question of life itself in order to think what or in order to think i guess the implications of a world with design in mind means like what it means to think that there was there's an author to the world in other words god so that puts us here into the analytic of teleological judgment like the analytic in any of the other books so teleology is the introduction of the idea of ends in the chain of cause and effect so as he sets out in the critique of pure reason The phenomenal world is guided by the law of cause and effect, or it is at least subsumed under the law of cause and effect, in that there is nothing in the world that does not follow by the law of cause and effect. There's nothing that comes from without a cause. There's nothing that was just fell from nothing uh, in order to exist. Everything came from something else. So Kant says, well, okay, if we think about that, then how can we we make sense of something coming to an end or a thing having a purpose? Because if it was just cause and effect, it would almost just be like, uh, you know, predetermined chance, which might seem like an oxymoron, but taking Kant's whole project in mind, it kind of makes sense in that it's, it's just like a pre-established um, aleatory system. So think about it this way for a second, at least this idea between ends and just cause and effect. Um, When we look at the world through, you know, we experience the world, we can probably make the case for either. So we could probably say, well, all things keep going. Like if somebody dies, their body turns into... Um, essentially fertilizer for the earth to be kind of grim about it um, which then feeds you know birds which then defecate and and create plants that you know humans can then come to eat and it's like the circle of life as per the lion king uh, that keeps things going in an endless chain of cause and effect so you know that might be the trained mind might look at the world that way but at the same time there are things that seem to end without having any more place in in the world um take for example the ends of some species uh where you know certain species just get um become extinct you know as per our pretty um heinous treatment of the earth and and animals these species come to be extinct and that is certainly uh, the marker of an end without you know any anything coming out of it or what about the ends of humanity itself? Because, and actually I'll save that for later. But to kind of circle back, it seems as though either can be possible. The world could be guided by pure cause and effect, or there could be things that end. And how do we make sense of those ends then? So with this, he draws a distinction between inner uh, objective material purposiveness and relative objective material purposes or purposiveness. So inner objective material purposiveness is the kind of uh, purposiveness that the object has for itself, whereas relative uh, objective material purposiveness is the um, purpose that an object serves or being serves for something else. So for example, the apple has relative objective material purposiveness in relation to humans or deer or whatever that eats the apple for its own end. And, you know, this, there's essentially a whole chain of this occurring. And what he comes to say is that it always ends with humanity. Humans are the top of this chain, which is obviously pretty problematic because, you know, how do we, how do humans lay claim to superiority over, you know, non-human animals, which he, he argues a pretty good argument, I think, but at the same time, there are some, um, 
you know, there there are actually some implications in this that for like animal rights stuff, like he does not foreclose such possibilities to animals, but he does trace this chain, this kind of the hierarchy of nature or the um, whatever it's called the um, uh, the oh my god, I don't know the circle of life, whatever animals eating smaller or weaker animals, which might be said to serve you know, uh, for a general equilibrium on the part of the earth where it comes down to humans to kind of eat animals in order to keep them, their populations at bay. Now that's ex- again, extremely problematic because why do humans, uh, deserve this kind of superiority over animals? But in any case, this is what he says that humans are the kind of final end of the, I can't believe that term is evading me. Please someone comment it the circle of life or whatever, the survival of the fittest. So he gives us a definition of what an end really is when when a thing is considered to be an end in itself. So he says that a thing is possible only as an end where the causality to which it owes its origin must not be sought in the mechanism of nature, but in a cause whose capacity of acting is determined by concepts. So it is an end, not if it's just some lousy product of another thing in the chain of nature, but that actually ushers from something else. So if you're starting to get the sense here that Kant's trying to say that humans don't usher from nature as per some like evolutionary argument, then I think that you're right. For him, it is impossible for humans or any living thing to arrive arise out of non-living things. So Kant is like, it, you know, living things must have come from somewhere. There's no way that a living thing could have come out of a rock or take this chain all the way back from where did, you know, even the first material come from? Like it must have come. There's no way something came out of nothing, right? So this is how he's kind of building, setting the stage for this argument. Now, things of nature for him, although he ascribes like the highest order to humans, things of nature to him have ends. So he takes the example of a tree and a tree for him, because it is kind of self-sustaining and it is self-multiplying in that it, you know, sprouts more trees because of its self, it is its own end. That is, it is its own cause and effect in that it, it produces itself. It is cause and effect. Now he contrasts that with like an art object, which was designed purely out of like some intent. So, nature is self-organizing whereas something like a watch is not so if you take out a part of the watch the watch dies whereas if you take out you know a root from a tree it will be able to sustain itself because it will compensate for that now this will color the a distinction that he makes between mechanism and teleology where a mechanistic thing is something that um and I would like to say this is by no means the last word on this problem. There are debates about this very thing, like what necessarily is a mechanism for Kant. But a mechanism is an object in which the parts determine the whole. So the parts of the watch make the watch. Therefore, if you take out a part of the uh, one of the parts, then the whole crumbles. Whereas with something like a tree, the whole, which is um, not mechanical, it is it is teleological. The whole is determined by, or sorry, the whole determines the parts. So if you take out a part, it doesn't actually affect the entire whole. So nature for him is something quite enigmatic, because if we just tried to explain the world as cause and effect, you know, we're thinking about it moving from almost, you know, progressively from left to right. Like, it's it's almost like there's just a linear, straight out path. But nature doesn't move linearly for Kant. You know, the tree will reproduce itself. That's almost like a freezing of of the chain of cause and effect, where the tree is actually, to at least to my knowledge, vying to live for as long as possible, in or by keeping itself alive, not necessarily producing an effect that is external to it, but producing itself as a um, a kind of closed system, like a tautology. And it is in this way that he says that nature can demonstrate intrinsic natural perfection. And that this kind of perfection evades 
anything that our understanding is capable of grasping. It is, uh, it, it evades all analogy. It evades, um, essentially transcends beauty. That is nature in its totality. But given this, like, it seems as though there's no way for us to ascribe to nature any ends. Like, it just seems like nature is destined to try and reproduce itself forever, which indeed is, is what it does. Like, it, it, it is an organism that tries to reproduce itself. But, the, sorry, but it isn't an organism for Kant because organisms are, referred, are reserved for living things. And it is only living things that can ascribe ends to nature where if a tree dies, we don't know if it had sprouted itself or multiplied itself already, you know, uh, quite a few feet away or or whatever, or has, you know, uh, laid the foundations for itself to come up again several years later. Whereas if a human dies, that's it. If an animal dies, that's it. It th As an animal, as a human, it can't come up again. Which, you know, who's to say that when... A coyote dies and its body, you know, gets fed into the earth and then, you know, a bird eats and then defecates and produces shrubbery that another coyote eats and then grows strong and then is able to reproduce again, uh, that that new offspring was not in some way connected to that original coyote. Who knows, right? I, I can't say. But for Kant, ends are, I guess, limited or reserved for organisms, living things. So humans, mostly in ascribing to nature this idea of ends, actually saves it to some extent from just pure chance, as though there's no plan, right? As though it's just, you know, just a consequence, a tragic misstep in, in you know, the uh, course of human history of, or of the universal history that has produced this thing. So Kant says that a teleological argument implants the idea of ends, which is meant in a way to combat the kind of pure chance that is assumed of cause and effect. Now, he wants to be careful not to ascribe to this, you know, um, a universal divine author, right? As though because there's ends, there must have been means that, you know, transcend cause and effect, i.e. God or something like that. Instead, so far, he's just trying to demonstrate that Humans have this propensity to recognize a priori, you know, we can speculate about the existence of the, these ends, which then demonstrates a kind of imminence, you know, within us of that recognition, which then we know because we are a part of that, you know, natural world, phenomenologically, might have some kind of connection. There might be some truth to it, I should say. So in his words... We seek only here to designate a kind of natural causality on an analogy with our own causality in a technical employment of reason. So this is from this critique of practical reason, the second critique, in which he demonstrates that humans are ends in themselves, in that humans are the kind of guiding thread between the noumenal and the phenomenal world because we house the practical faculties of the practical faculty of reason and desire matched with understanding and knowledge that allow us to breach into a kind of moral purpose that gives us a kind of purchase on morality. And it is because of this recognizing humans as ends and having each having their own ends according to a universal law that we have some kind of uh, peek into via our, you know, existing at the interstice of the phenomenal and noumenal world. And because we can't say that we exist separately from nature, because that would be to say that humans are transcendent, nature must too have this same kind of connection to the noumenal and the phenomenal world. It must in itself have some kind of end to it. So now we move into the dialectic of teleological judgment, which is where he's going to demonstrate that uh, this idea that he kind of developed in the analytic is doomed to fail and how we must then uh, kind of circumvent that impasse or, or, or remedy it. And he does that by providing two equal yet oppositionary arguments that cancel each other out, that show that there is a contradiction in the argument. So he says that 
he provides the first argument, and that is that the world is governed by purely mechanistic, um, kind of mechanistic order of cause and effect. And he contrasts that with the antithesis that the world is governed by cause and effect, but there are instances in which we cannot explain uh, something because of just by cause and effect. There's there there's the possibility of ends that seems to, you know, transcend that domain of cause and effect. And normally, how he would uh, prove this right, or how he would kind of get past this, would be to say that the thesis, in this case, he'd say that the thesis, the idea that the world is just mechanistic, it just runs by cause and effect, is a truth of the sensible world, that is the phenomenal world, while the antithesis, that there are instances in which um, things seem to escape the realm of cause and effect, emanates from the super sensible or the noumenal world. But he doesn't do that here. And this is a really jarring moment, at least when I was reading it, because in relation to all the other, you know, the other two books, he does something totally different here, where he says, I can't, you know, get around this, because we are dealing with here what he calls a determinative or constitutive judgment, which means that he can't claim, which would be to say that there is a truth of an, a thing outside of us. So when we are dealing with a determinative, determinative, determinative judgment or a constitutive judgment, we are trying to tell a truth about the thing, in this case, nature, being either mechanistic or escaping mechanism. So he says, as long as we think that way, we can't resolve this. We can't just say one is from the super sensible world, one is from the sensible world, and then wipe our hands of it and move on because we are ascribing way too much autonomy to the thing itself. It'd be like me saying whether or not a pen exists. Like, I have no idea, no clue. Like, it's, it might, who knows? So instead, how he tries to remedy this is by switching it from a determinative or constitutive judgment to a regulative one. What does that mean? What is regulative? He says, well, if we just change the language from saying a truth, an ostensible truth about a thing exterior to us, that is nature, and instead frame it as being a truth about our relationship to nature, then we can get somewhere. So he transforms those, the, the thesis and the antithesis into the following. So the thesis, instead of saying that the nature is uh, mechanistic, he says, all production of material things and their forces must be judged as possible on mere mechanical laws. And then the antithesis, instead of saying there are things that escape the uh, mechanistic nature of the world, he says some products of material nature cannot be judged as possible on mere mechanical laws. That is, judging then quite a different law of causality is required, namely that of final causes. Now, this is a bit of a cop-out. Kant is saying, you know, we can't prove anything about it, so let's just say it comes down to the individual observer. But it makes sense, considering what he had done in the first half of this book, in that he was demonstrating the kind of potential of looking at the world in terms of the subjective universality. That is, we are all subjectively engaged in the universal acquisition of beauty or attempts to un acquire a sense of the beautiful. So we are bound in that way. And this is the kind of guiding moment, I think, in the whole of his three books, in that he's demonstrating here, he, if we recognize humans as occupying this kind of liminal space between the phenomenal and the noumenal world, we have no other recourse than to look at humans as individual beings in the phenomenal world, that is, with perceptions of this phenomenal world that have a foot in the noumenal world, which is also connected to the you know noumenal parts of the natural world. And it is through that that it is only by virtue of our experiencing it, because we can't actually call upon our knowledge of the noumenal world, it is only by our experiencing it and our judging it and our cognizing it that we can actually lay claim to any truth of the matter. So that's why this, to me, makes sense. But I'm not, you know, I, I'm not the last word on this for sure. But this is what he says more broadly about proposing a regulative judgment. So a judgment that's concerned with our judging of a thing, not the thing itself. He says that uh, 
when we look upon nature with regulative judgment, what we are saying is that by all peculiar constitution of my cognitive faculties, the only way I can judge of the possibility of those things and of their production is by conceiving for that purpose a cause working designedly, that is having a, a, a design in mind, having a kind of intelligence. A being whose productivity is analogous to the causality of an understanding. So if let's let's pretend for a second that we had uh, a determining judgment that is a judgment that could actually determine a thing as it should be like the kind of truth of everything then that would mean that we wouldn't need judgment at all because we would just be in the thick of it and we would be perfectly one with the world but we we don't have that convenience that is only allotted to god we instead navigating have to navigate between a seemingly chaotic phenomenal world that's governed by the law of cause and effect that is up up to chance that emanates from the the physical world uh, the noumenal world and it is in many ways a product of the freedom that is that comes from it because of that we need this kind of reflective judgment and this reflective judgment is what kind of likens us to he doesn't say this because he he obviously wouldn't be blasphemous in this way, but it likens us to God in that it gives us this capacity to look upon the world almost as God did after, in the Bible at least, after the seventh day, you know, looked upon its domain or whatever the words are. So with this whole argument, what he's doing is responding to, uh, and this is right out of the book, to Epicureanism and Spinozism. So for how Kant characterizes Epicureanism. And he goes into and he breaks them down and explains why they're all wrong. And I'm not going to go into each because that takes up a lot of time. And it's just like a negative thing. Not negative as in like bad, but it doesn't tell us anything about Kant. It's just telling us about why he thinks he's different or why these other perspectives are wrong, which doesn't actually get us anywhere. Uh, it's just critique without giving us anything. Uh, so he's responding to the idealist and realist approaches to nature. So, for example, Epicureanism, idealism would see the world as arriving by chance, so mechanistic cause and effect, whereas Spinozism, uh, Spinozist idealism believes in a kind of creator, but this creator is ultimately indifferent to life. Um, and then he introduces or uses the term uh, hy hylosism or, or hylosist. Uh, believing that the world is comprised of all like living things, everything in the world is living, which doesn't really get us anywhere for Kant. Um, and then there's theistic realism, believing that the world uh, was absolutely intended by, you know, a, a god, right? And these explanations for Kant, in my mind, leave out, uh, essentially leave out the human. Like, where does the human figure into all this? Like, we're just... Uh, you know, cogs in this machine. Whereas for Kant, I think he's ascribing more value to the human and that the human mind is a very wonderful thing for him. But in proposing his own thought here, that is, he's kind of bridging the two, even between like um, idealism and realism. He's, he's bridging the two in that he's saying that we aren't going to do away with mechanical laws when we propose teleological ones. Because we only experience the world through these mechanical laws. We can't just get rid of them. But we have to recognize that these mechanical laws would not have existed if there wasn't a teleological law. That is, a tele teleological law that demonstrates there to have been a divine author in mind that gave birth to these mechanical laws. So he gives primacy to the teleological laws, but says that we can't do away with the mechanical ones because they are our foray they are our, our open door to these teleological laws and that puts us here into the appendix the first appendix the theory of the method of teleological judgment which serves as more of a i guess kind of a conclusion than anything else but anyways so now essentially we ask what can tele teleology do now that he set this out that there's this possible teleological argument what can it do is it a branch of natural science or does it belong to theology? Uh, it essentially can only belong to one or the other because you can't have a teleological argument that is appropriated by natural science because it posits a god. And then you can't have one that, you know, 
posits a god and then attempt to be used by natural science because if there's a god then everything is just you know there's this divine creator or whatever and you know we can't look at the world purely empirically and then he says it actually belongs to neither it, and this is fun he says it belongs to critique which is like what the what the hell are you on about like what is it it belongs to critique specifically it belongs to the critique of judgment it critiques judgment as purely subjective enterprise that looks upon the world only mechanistically. So teleology swoops in to save the kind of human in their judging from just a simple aesthetic judgment, as though it's just all subjective. Like there's no um, possible truth to, to it all, a truth that we'll never know, but a truth that is nevertheless there in the positing of a teleological explanation. So in order to kind of situate him with the biological arguments of the time, he labels himself an epigenesis or epigenesist. He belongs to the camp of epigenesis, which is different from at that time, the theory of evolution, where at that time, the theory of evolution suggested that there was a kind of straight shot to a, a creator, a god, which might seem totally counterintuitive, but that's what he's speaking to here. Um, so he says that epigenesis uses the least possible expenditure of the supernatural, which is very Kantian. Like, he doesn't want to just appeal to there being a god and that resolving all the problems. So he's like, it takes the least possible expenditure of the supernatural as it entrusts to nature the explanation of all steps subsequent to the original beginning while refraining from determining that original beginning. So it recognizes it's there. Because we exist in a world of cause and effect, we know that it must have come from somewhere for Kant. Uh, and because we have these kind of rational faculties and this propensity to experience the world and have um, a kind of experience of morality that ushers from the noumenal world, which signals our capacity for freedom and to in even just the tiniest moment to break away from the chain of cause and effect demonstrates that there is this order that is outside of the chain of cause and effect even though we can never determine it. We can't label it. Or, well, I guess we could label it, but we can't understand it. So we must appeal to this argument that he levels in the second critique, the critique of practical reason, of our moral dispositions in order to prove the existence of God. So we can't just look upon nature what do you, in a, a kind of physical physico the, theology, like look at nature and say, oh, nature has a structure, so therefore, it must have been designed like nature on its own wouldn't could possibly never have a structure. So it must come from something. Kant is like, no, 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 that that won't get us there. What will get us there is recognizing our propensity to look at nature as a as a as an, having a teleological end, and no, recognizing that that recognition of the teleological end emanates from our having a certain moral disposition. Re, you know, indicative of a freedom, uh, indicative of freedom, that then shows that there is a kind of noumenal substrate to this world that must, in some sense, be the place from which this world arrives. But again, and it's necessary to keep repeating this, he's not saying that God, like, has a face or that it's, like, a thing that we could possibly know. But despite this, he appeals to theology because he sees theology as that attempt, as the branch of philosophy that assumes the validity and pure, of pure practical reason as morality in accordance with a moral law that implies a God that has direct grasp of this moral law that we can only possibly, you know, touch. We might have a faint moment when we come close to it. Uh, and that leaves the slightest sliver of hope, possibility that we, you know, there is this d divine creator with an intention, even though we can never know it. So faith pretty much picks off where pure practical reason or where pure theoretical reason where science leaves off, right? What science can't answer, Kant leaves to faith, which more or less wraps this up. Um, I, I know that the times between the first part and the second part here are, are off, but I did that deliberately just so I would cover the aesthetic judgment in that half and the teleological one here. Hope it's not off-putting, but anyways. Um, I'd like to hear what anyone has to say. 
about this. Uh, if anyone knows more about it and thinks that I mischaracterized it, I just would like to say I deliberately omitted some, you know, some strange paths that Kant goes down explaining like uh, certain differences between other camps of thought that he's, you know, writing against. Um, the, the, he has this whole thing about the discursive versus the intuitive or versus intuition that I didn't find particularly relevant. I found it more confusing, if anything. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I might not do another Kant text as far as I know. Uh, but yeah, like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, um, leave me stars on whatever podcast platform you're on. And I'll catch you next week. Take care.